and welcome everyone to this episode of Freedom Hub's Working Group. I'm your host, Jeff Cantor, along with Charles Froman. 5G wireless arms are an issue that we have covered for a long time. Uh, we started off a year or two ago with Theodore Scarato from Environmental Health Trust, and we were just learning the issue at that time. Since then, we've had Julian Gresser just a couple weeks ago talk about safe schools and a project to find a couple schools willing to go wired versus wireless. And we've also had my client, the National Health Federation's uh, monitoring mitigation projects presented by Murray Bauer and Jenny DeMarco. And today, through my involvement in the wireless issue, we have learned about Paul G at Wire America. And he has had a lot of success in California and is fast becoming a leader in the movement nationwide just for his ability to understand the facts in a very uh, perfectionist way and also communicate them. Uh, also, he's been very hands-on with legislatures and the FCC. Uh, so unlike a lot of people who just complain on Facebook, it, uh, he, he's very active on following up on all of his recommendations and can really tell the rest of us how to do it right. Also, Paul has had victory with his governor in California, getting him to veto a industry bill that would make it even easier to erect these wireless transmitters all over the place. He is going to give us an update. All right. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Paul G. And my little tagline is better than 4G or 5G. There's Paul G. And that's because I've got some uh, good ideas that you can do to help defend your home, your family, and your community from what is essentially a home invasion. And it's a home invasion by the wireless industry trying to insert into your bedroom, your bathroom, just way too much microwave radiation. And they don't have a right to do that. And if you follow the laws really carefully, you will understand that you have to track through some of this legal distinctions in order to be able to make some progress. Now, across the country, we have kind of two main categories of states. See, the wireless industry has been hard at work lobbying. They spend billions of dollars a year doing it. And they try to convince everybody to pass favorable laws. They try to get some at the federal level. They try to get some good orders out of the FCC. And they try to get laws passed at your state level. So there's an organization called the American Legislative Exchange Council. That's a non-governmental organization that is financed by the wires companies and a lot of other large corporations. They will uh, pay people to write legislation and they will vote it through as a group. And once they approve it, then it is dispatched and handed to your state legislatures and they are told to pass it. And that is how you got a, a series of bad telecom bills across the United States in about 30 states. I have a list I can visit later to show you which of those states are. About 20 states have avoided passing such a bill. We've had two attempts in California to get that bill passed. One in 2017, we got a veto. And another one in 2021, we got another veto. Well, that's because we stand up and we try to convince our elected representatives this is not the way to go. You don't have to give the wireless industry all these extra benefits. The reason I mention these two sides of the country, and it's not really sides because it's a patchwork, but two different areas is you have different strategies you have to deploy in these different areas. So I'm gonna just say for California, very best thing you could do, we don't have a bad state bill, neither does New York, Washington state is that way and Oregon is that way. A lot of the ones out here in the West, a lot of the Midwest fell and they, they passed this bad state bill. Texas fell, Florida fell. New York still doesn't have it. Massachusetts doesn't have it. So for those states that don't have a bad state bill, your best move by far is to convince your town to pass a local ordinance that says, yes, we can, we can let in wireless telecommunications devices into particular zones, not residential zones. And the key thing here is you just have to keep you know, use it with very good language. You never say you're prohibiting anything because that's in the law not to prohibit. You just say, these are the places you're allowed and you never put residential on the list. That's important to do. And I'm gonna tell everybody that there's a big problem with some model code that is out there being handed out to people left and right by Americans for Responsible Technology. And on their model code, they unbelievably list 
residential zones as one of the possible places for wireless telecommunications facilities to go. We, man, we saw this, we pointed out to them and said, don't do this. You need two sets of code, one for the states without a bad state bill and one for the states with the bad state bill. But you don't just say this is one code that works for everybody because you're misleading about half the country. Well, they won't do anything about it. They haven't fixed their code in over a year and a half. So you have to be very careful about everybody who holds a shingle out and says, oh, I'm an expert, right? At the end of the day, the best expert you can have is yourself. And the way you become an expert is you read the laws that apply to you and your community. Because everyone goes to these national things and they go, oh, tell me what I need to do to succeed. It is completely dependent on what is your state law, what is your local law. Because frankly, at the federal level, we're in pretty good shape. And so you can actually you know, get most of your protections from your current state laws and from your current um, uh, local laws. And you just get them to pass better local laws. So that's the first thing we did. We got a veto in uh, 2017. So we worked you know, six months full time to try to make progress in uh, the California legislature. And you know, predictably, we weren't doing so well to begin with, but then we got a little bit smarter as we went along. And we used an Americans with Disabilities uh, Act accommodation for electromagnetic sensitivity. Now, let me tell people who may not know what this is. Look, a lot of the people who get interested in this topic are here because they are already electromagnetically sensitive. And that would describe me. Uh, I cannot stand next to a cell tower. I can't be in rooms with Wi-Fi. I don't even have my phone on for more than maybe two minutes a day. And that's just to send a text. I almost rarely call anybody because I actually physically react to it, okay? And, and I've been pushed into a category where it's a problem for me. Well, am I in good company? Yes, with about 10% of the population right now, and we're growing because there's just way too much power going through the air. And, you know, Arthur Furstenberg just sent out this whole big thing today, and it's very well done, but it's even at low power, it's a problem, okay? So there's really not a prescribed best power for any of this stuff. So, you know, we have a federal government that stepped forward 25 years ago and said in a law, well, we need a nationwide wireless network. And so they've been doing it for 25 years. But right about now, they're done. Right about now, there's no more need to do anything more. We have a nationwide wireless network for telecommunications. Telecommunications is different than communications. Telecommunications has a very particular definition. And you can ride this definition all the way to victory in your town. Telecommunications definition is very simple. Very, it's going on right now. There is voice leaving my mouth and it's going through the wires and going directly to your ear. Is it getting changed or transformed along the way? No, it's not. Okay, so we're getting it there directly and in yesteryear, it was through a switched network, but today it can still happen over the internet. But the point is, it is not something that is part of a database. It's not something that's part of a web application. It's not anything where there's programming involved. It's just a direct transmission of communication by voice. That's telecommunications. And that is all they have preemption for. And this is a key fact most people miss. They get confused and the wireless industry has talked them into thinking that any use of wireless is part of this scheme and we have a chance to do any wireless thing we want because we have a law to support us. Nothing could be further from the truth. The only rights you have to come into community is to provide wireless outdoor phone calls. Outdoor, not indoor. Outdoor. What? Don't, don't they have to have an in-building coverage? Don't they have to actually come into my living room or in my bathroom to make sure that I can make a call? No, they have no right to do that. <laughs> and there's your problem. Everyone's getting talked into, oh, modern technology means that we need these extra antennas to get more power into your house in order to have this great functioning network. That's a great business idea for us. and makes us a lots of money, but your town doesn't have to go along with this at all. Your town can have a very simple test. And this test is established in the, in the U.S. Courts of Appeals for almost every, every uh, circuit. There are 11 geographic circuits in the U.S. We're in the ninth circuit in California. The second circuit is back in New York, all right? 
So this simple test, it was decided in 2005 in California, but in earlier years in other circuits. And it's simply this, is there a significant gap in telecommunications service? Yes or no? Can you bring evidence forward to prove that you have that gap? If all your town requires is that test, you win because there is no gap. Because the definition of a significant gap in telecommunication service is the ability to make an outdoor phone call in most places. Not every conceivable, every conceivable place you can imagine, just in most places. So what does that mean? On the major byways and highways, if you break down, you want to be able to make a wireless call to be able to, you know, summon some help. Okay, got it. So pretty much on your highways, you have to have it. Um, in neighborhoods, yeah, generally, you know, if you can go out on your porch or walk down the block and make a call, you're fine. Do you have to be able to make a call inside your house? Nope, not for a significant gap. Because this is what they have. This is a really key, important point that you can bring up in any, any argument in any meeting. Hi, folks. We're living in an area where we don't have a lot of wireless signal. And yeah, we really can't make phone calls inside by trying to connect to a tower. But what can we do? Well, we get cable service or we get fiber optic service and we can turn on a little function on our phone called Wi-Fi calling. There you go. You can turn on Wi-Fi calling and use your internet connection you got by wire in order to place a call. There you go. So there is no argument for, oh, you have to have enough telecommunications signals from the tower to make a call inside your house. That doesn't exist. And that is what you really want to think about. You don't want to go along with the home invasion of too much power coming right into your house. You are much better off served by large macro towers that are 200 feet in the air, 2,500 feet or more away from you. Well, that describes their strategy from 10 or 15 years ago. That's how they built all their cell towers back then. And there weren't as many controversies back then for cell towers because they do what Andrew Campanelli says they did. And he asks for this in every single town. You need three cell towers in a town to cover the whole thing. You get one at the dump, you get one at the electric substation, you know, and you get one at the sewage treatment plant. Boom, you're done. You don't need another single tower. That's it. You're finished. And this whole thing of putting these things in front of your house was always a bad idea. It is not supported by the laws. It is not supported by the court decisions. It is not even supported by the uh, intentional, the act of itself. The 1996 Telecommunications Act has a definitive document that tells you what its legislative intent was. And before we end, I'll show a few things on my websites, but this is one you can take to the bank. Pretty much says, it's not our intent to put 50 foot towers in residential districts, period, the end. It's not our intent to do small cells. It said that in 1996. So you can use that and then tell everybody that we're not going in this direction. This is just a bad propaganda sales job done by the wires industry. And our town could be a lot smarter. All right, that's all in the, t in the states where they don't have a bad state bill. Let's switch over to the states that have the bad state bill. Oh man, they did a bad deal to you, okay? What they did is they said, well, we, the state, Look at this as a statewide matter, a statewide concern. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to preempt your local authority over making decisions about these going into the public rights way. And they're just going to be able to go right in. But you have to read that law really carefully. Now, Arizona got the first law like this passed in 2017. It's one of the worst ones we've ever read. Yet, we found a great public safety loophole. In matters of public safety, you can deny a tower. <laughs> What's public safety? Hey, that's a big topic. That's good. Public safety just doesn't mean, oh, we hire a bunch of police and fire. That's public safety. Oh, no. Oh, no. Public safety extends beyond that into zoning laws. Okay. What else? Oh, into negative health consequences. Oh, really? Yep. Into the quiet enjoyment of streets. These are all rights that you have that your city must deliver on. Hold on. How can we do that if we're putting overpowered cell phone towers right in front of our houses? That's ruining our quiet enjoyment of streets, causing negative health consequences. It's not protecting my property values or my safe, my public safety. Wait a minute. This is way off the reservation. How do we get around it? Invoke public safety. Don't invoke 
health effects. See, invoke the larger category, public safety, because they know they have to do something about public safety. Okay, the only reason they don't touch health effects is because that was a propaganda war won by the wireless industry. And if we have time, we'll go over that because that's another specific page on my website. But it's nothing more than a propaganda war. It's not real. Okay, in almost every circuit, maybe the second circuit's a little different, but almost every other circuit, health effects is squarely on the table. Everybody can talk about it. Everybody can make decisions based upon it. It's a myth that you can't do anything about it. Just a myth. So what it ends up being is it's just not uh, fashionable. That's it. It's not fashionable in the eyes of your city attorneys. It's not fashionable in the eyes of your legislators. It's not fashionable in the eyes of your city council members. They feel that they're going out on a limb if they did it based on that. So you don't have to win it on health effects. That's why you use public safety, boom. Gives them another whole category that they can now wrap it up with a whole bunch of other things, okay? So what you do is you say, again, what Andrew Campanelli says, and if you listen to any of his uh, recordings, you'll learn a lot. And I, there are a lot of them on my website and they're worth listening to. He is the best local telecom attorney in the country. He works all across the country and he wins these cases all the time because these are irresponsible placements of wires telecommunications facilities or WTFs, we say for short. Now we use WTF for the very obvious reason. And they want to use WCF. That's the new thing that the industry pushes, wireless communications facility, because they don't want to be bogged into saying only telecommunications. Well, that's not what you want. You want to pull them right back to telecommunications. All we're talking about is telecommunications. No other communications but telecommunications. Because when you talk about the other forms of communications, meaning internet and texting and all these other things, you don't have to do that wirelessly at all. There's no law that forces you to do it that way. So your town can have a preference for just doing it. Sorry, just hung up on them. <laughs> Should unplug my phone. Um, a preference for how you would like to get internet. And frankly, the best way is by wire, of course. And it's for this very simple consumer choice, okay? If you get the signal to my house by wire, then I as a consumer, have this consumer choice whether or not I want to run a wireless access point or a wireless router. And so I, ch I choose myself whether I want the quote convenience of wireless inside my house. And I give, uh, and for that, I'm willing to put up with the downsides, which is clearly damaging my children and my pets, my plants and everything else in the house, okay? It's just that you're not aware of how much it does damage you. And so, but look, people can make bad decisions and we have the freedom to make those bad decisions all the time. And so the point here is that if it's a consumer choice, then at least you can make the call that I'm either gonna be in wireless or not be in wireless. And that's a house by house by house decision, all right? Now, if you allow them to put these things out at the curb, well, now you take a house like mine. We don't have a stitch of wireless. Everything goes through ethernet cables in my house. No wireless whatsoever. Well, I couldn't achieve that anymore. I would be done. All right, my whole home environment has been invaded and I can't do anything about it. And I'm not even a subscriber to the service of what's happening at the pole. I'm just collateral damage. And so that takes away consumer choice. That's why you can't allow these on the, on the polls. So there are very good arguments that you can use even in these states that uh, seem to think they have a right to come in your rights away. And it's all about three variables. All right, and you have every single cell tower has three important parameters that can be regulated locally. And they are vertical, horizontal, and power. VHP, vertical, horizontal power. Vertical, horizontal power. If you haven't regulated all three, you've achieved nothing. Ooh, why is that? You've heard these arguments, I think, if you've done any of this work with your local city. You get into a big argument about only one of the three parameters, horizontal offset. And you sit there and go, oh, we have to be 2,500 feet away. Oh, but well, we can't do that if we're in the public rights away. So we'll compromise, you know? And so we'll say it's, uh, you know, 50 feet from your house. You go, no, no, it's gotta be further, you know? So it's gotta be 500 feet from schools. Oh no, it's gotta be 100 feet. Oh, they go back and forth between these numbers. Oh, we, we compromised on 350 feet and you think you've accomplished something. You've accomplished nothing. 
if the wireless company's goal is to get inside your bedroom with a certain amount of radiation and they're 50 feet from the house, well, they have a certain power profile. If they want to do the same thing from 250 feet away, turn up the power. <laughs> it's not hard. Nobody's policing it. Oh, so horizontal offset doesn't really mean anything? Yep, not until you get about 2,500 or more feet away. So that's why you have to get into the power game, okay? And what you really have to think about is what are these small cells on these poles? And again, this is for the states where they have the bad state bill. These things are cannons. And your goal is to turn it from a cannon into a squirt gun. And how do you do that? You use FCC regulation against them. The FCC already regulates output, maximum power output from what? A wireless router. Yeah, your home wireless router is capped by the FCC. There's regulations for it. Cool. Well, why do they do that? Well, you see, we can't actually take a chance that uh, anybody operating a wireless router might create a really bad condition inside their house. So we have to cap the power. Um, and then we can't take the chance of this thing maybe interfering with somebody, somebody else within the neighborhood. So we have to cap the power. And we don't let you put this thing outside because if you did, it would interfere with other signals out there. So we have to cap the power. So we cap the power at what? 0.1 watt of effective radiated power. Okay, hold on, let's do the math here. I live 50, 100 feet from my neighbor on one side, 50, 100 feet the other way. Okay, so each of us have to cap the power of our wireless antenna so that we don't interfere with them. Yes, that's right, the FCC says. Cool. So let's talk about that pole. Is that pole any different than any of my neighbors here? No, not really. They live in your neighborhood too. Where do they live? On your parcel. Oh, I see. It's on my parcel. I have some control over that because it's on my parcel. Okay, let's, let's make some progress this way. Who owns the public rights of way? It's a very gray area. You talk to different people, you get different answers. And believe me, it's a very specific answer. It's an answer that you have to research and it's the developer who set up your neighborhood. But if you do, you will see that there was a whole bunch of land that used to be a farm and they cut it up into different lots and parcels. And they decided they would sell those parcels to put a house on it, but we had to have a way to get to the house. So we have this thing called a street. And we also have sidewalks and those are to be used for public uses. Everybody can use the street, everybody can use the sidewalk. Well, how exactly do we handle that from a land ownership perspective? Different neighborhoods do it differently, but a very common way is this. All right, listen, we are gonna seed the uh, space for the street of the developer. We'll seed the space for the street to the city and the city will manage it as a public asset on behalf of all the public. Therefore, the expense of maintaining it will go to the city, but they have to do it for the good of the public. Cool, we understand that. Now let's look at the rest of that parcel. Hey, it's not too difficult to look at your map and see that my backyard's kind of a straight line and my side yards are a straight line. They're easy to understand. That's the line between me and my neighbors, got it. Hey, what's happening close to the curb? What's going on there? Well, you own pretty much up to the curb. How do you know that? Because the city often will tell you, you have to maintain everything up to that curb. And sometimes you have like a sidewalk and a strip of grass and then the curb. Yeah, you gotta cut that grass. You gotta maintain all that. Well, why is that? Isn't that the city's property? Oh no, 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 they make you maintain it. Well, okay, so it's your property. Yes, it is. But there's an easement and the easement says, well, we, the city, can come in and do kind of some work in there. We can, you know, fix that sidewalk. We may charge you to fix the sidewalk like they do in San Francisco, but we will do the work and we will fix the sidewalk. And, you know, we'll make sure there's a good curb to the street. And if we have to, we might have to get maybe six feet or eight feet into your lawn to like dig a little thing to put in a meter or something. But, you know, we have a right to operate some stuff on this lawn. Why is that? Because you gave an easement to him when you bought your property. But look, this whole thing is tied to your parcel. 
And what we're discovering, this is new learning from the last week. I'm working with attorneys on this. We are, we are discovering that the wireless industry is trying to get some extra propaganda benefits. They are convincing cities to uh, uh, issue permits to not the landowner, but to the owner of the structure on the land. What? This doesn't ever happen, okay? You don't ever get a permit for the pool that's in your backyard that is only assigned to the address of that pool. That is a permit issued to that address of the parcel on which you build the pool, on which you build the fence. So you couldn't have somebody go in and put a pool in your backyard unless they checked in with the landowner. Makes sense, right? <laughs> so here they are saying they can come in on your parcel and change fundamentally the use of a pole that you've allowed to be on there uh, at the inception of your neighborhood. Now look, let's think this through. A lot of neighborhoods are old. A lot of neighborhoods never envisioned telecommunication services coming into the public rights way. Did they specifically give rights to anybody to do this? They did not. This is open season. This is the terms here, and you can look this up later. The terms are condemnation of property and reverse condemnation of property. And reverse condemnation of property has a whole bunch of benefits. It means that you get to go out and have the lawsuit. They have to cover the, the cost of the attorneys. They have to give you compensation. They have to do a lot. And at the end of the day, it's going to be too damn expensive to do all that and still operate these poles in front of your house. So this is a fundamentally excellent idea and a field day for any local attorney in your town. Have them look specifically into what are the deeds that set up my neighborhood and what are the rights that go along in the easements in my public rights of way? And were any of them specific enough to allow these telecommunication companies to come in and you're gonna realize they're not. I'm telling you, every permit in the world is associated with a parcel, unless you live in Tucson, Arizona. I talked to the, uh, the guy who hands out addresses yesterday. Check out this little game. Hi, we're in Tucson, Arizona. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have three houses on a street. Let's just call it house 70, 80, and 90. For whatever reason, they skip every 10. Cool. So house uh, 80 is in the middle. All right. Well, so what's going on? There's been a pole that's been there for 30 years. It's been inert. You know, when I say inert, it means that it holds things that don't affect me. It holds wires to provide telephone service. It holds a uh, cable for my television. Okay, uh, maybe it's got fiber there too to come to my house. All those things are set on the pole, but you know, as it's sitting there and I'm standing next to it, it's not affecting me, it's inert. That's totally different than putting an antenna on there that's blasting you with a toxic poison 24 seven. That is no longer inert. So it's a different use. You are converting this pole that was allowed to be there for a particular purpose 30 years ago, and now you're changing its use. Well, did you ask me about that? No, we didn't. Did you compensate me for it? No, you didn't. Is that legal? No, it's not. And this you can make progress with. I like this idea, and I think we can really sell this idea. Here's Tucson, Arizona. We're the county, Pima County, and we have several cities that inside of us. One of them is the big city of Tucson, but they have other little cities, Moran and some others, and everyone does it differently. So some cities will make their own addresses, but for whatever reason, Tucson has decided to cede to the county the ability to assign an address. So you don't have one hand knowing what the other's doing. So what happens? Some clerk gets a request to establish an address for a cell tower in the public rights away. So those three houses I talked about, you know, six, six, what, 70, 80, and 90. In front of 80 is a pole. What did they do? They gave that pole the address 137. What? <laughs> a pole has its own address? Yes, because we're going to give a permit to that address. But it's on my property. Why aren't you talking to me? This is what they're doing. They're end running the whole planning system that's tied to parcels. You get to turn it right on back on them. 
and you get to upend that whole scheme. And that's what I think is really good to do. All right, so what are we, why don't we do this for a second? I'll share a screen. I'll just share a couple other things that are going on. And then I don't want to go too long uh, so I can uh, be responsive for questions. Does that all sound good to you, Jeff? Perfect. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to take my desktop right now and share it. And the purpose here is just to show you my web browser. We're not going to read much of these things, but I'm going to show you what some really good stuff is. Okay. Hey, you mentioned that OTARD rule. Remember that thing? Over the air reception device. And you said that it was a really big, bad rule and they'd be able to do all kinds of bad stuff to you. I have the antidote and I'm going to show you right now. Here it is. This is a, a page that you can get in uh, wireamerica.org. You just search for OTARD. OTARD is for over the air reception device. Okay, what is this? This is the whole order that was put out by the FCC. I generally copy paste it and then I will put highlights through the order. So you can look for stuff that's bold and pink. And if you just skip to that, you pretty much get the story of what's going on. So again, I don't wanna bury you with too much text, but I'm gonna go all the way down to where they finally do the rules, okay? Because you can see this is a long thing, but guess what? Appendix B is fairly short, you see? They have a whole bunch of, and this might be 30, 40 pages of, of text, just talk, 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 talk with, you know, all kinds of footnote this, footnote that. We're doing it for this reason, for that reason, whatever it is. But the only thing that really counts are these damn rules right here, okay? And so what I want to do is show you how poorly this rule is written, okay? All right, so here we are. Now we're going to finally put this in our rules, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to amend section 14000. Why? How? We're going to revise a particular paragraph and we're going to insert some text. Great. What are we going to say? Well, we're going to broaden the definition of what used to be just a satellite uh, dish to receive television signal. That's what it used to be. And that was fairly inert. It would not transmit. It would just receive. Well, now we're going to go ahead and somehow allow them to be cell towers to both receive and transmit. And we're going to do it with this text. All right. What's it say? used to receive direct broadcast satellite service, including direct to home satellite service, or to receive or transmit, right there, that's how they got it, fixed wireless signals via satellite, including a hub or relay, let me move my people here so I can read, antenna used to receive or transmit fixed wireless services that are in red, read it, not classified as telecommunication services. Ding, 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 really important phrase. Let's read further. Used to receive video programming services via some kind of multi-point thing and other multi-point thing, again, including fixed wireless, but not classified as telecommunications services. Oh, okay, cool, what's next? All right, we're gonna mention something else. For the purposes of a hub or relay antenna, used to tra transmit fixed wireless, but excludes any telecommunications services or, wait for it, commingled basis within telecommunications services. Hey, do you remember earlier when I said telecommunications services is the making of a call? And do you remember when I said there was uh, this option to do Wi-Fi calling? Well, Wi-Fi calling is, by definition, a commingled service. Why is this important? This whole rule, when you read the whole thing above, says, oh, we're going to overrun your city. We're not going to allow them to pass any laws or notify anybody or do anything. And everyone's going to be protected from liability. You don't get to sue anybody over this. This is just a simple over-the-counter deal. And yes, every person has the right to put up a cell tower on their roof if they wish, or maybe in their backyard if they wish. And they can be incentivized by the company, either paying them something or giving them a discount. And they're part of this rule until somebody makes a Wi-Fi call. Now you have to make a service. Now the whole rule doesn't apply to you. Now you as the homeowner are open to every lawsuit there ever was. And that is what you communicate to your neighbors. You say, you know, there's a poorly written rule by the FCC, they're moving fast. They're not really uh, crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. And so you may think that this company's pitching you, tell you that you could save 10 bucks a month on your uh, internet service. Well, that might be the most expensive decision you ever made because you might have saved maybe a hundred bucks a year on your internet, but I'm going to own your house. I'm going to go after and get your house because you are ruining the quiet and joy with my home and you can't do it because you 
have a commingled service. This rule doesn't apply to you. You got sold a bill of goods. Look, most people won't take the risk. Most people will say, fine, I'll just stick with my cable. Thanks. Thanks for informing me. And that's how you use this really poorly written rule to your advantage. OK, look, we're trying to win a whole lawsuit on this OTAR thing, and we're going to try to like put it aside. That's what Children's Health Defense is all about. But I mean, in the meantime, if you can read these really poorly written rules and use them for your advantage, you can make a lot of progress. And we went into Dalton Gardens, Idaho, October 7. There's a page I can show you. And you just listen to 20 minutes. I did 20 minutes and I talked them out of putting in a bad city sponsored wireless ordinance and going exactly the other direction. And they hired Andrew Campanelli and they're gonna get a good ordinance in there, all right? And this is the kind of thing you need to do. And this is a, 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 you know, a community by community kind of effort. And it's a little hard because you have to get some expertise before you can start making some progress. But it's a 3D chess game and you can mostly catch these guys on poorly written rules. Hey, I'm gonna show you another one right now that is really valuable, okay? And uh, I'm going to go to this site called OurTownOurChoice.org. And if somebody wants to put this in the chat, they can. But what you're going to find here is that uh, in solutions, we have two really important pages, one on NEPA and one on Kitoa. NEPA is awesome, OK? This is a whole page that describes everything to you. And it basically will uh, give you a video and you can watch it. I have a little cell tower college thing here, but we talk to the FCC about once every six months. And we, we put attorneys on the line from our side and they have attorneys on the line from their side. And we have a full official half hour conversation. And as such, that gives us standing in the FCC so we can file if we need to, okay? So I've talked to basically the NEPA queen, Erica Rosenberg since retired, but her boss, Garnett Hanley, got, we got her to admit something and I put it right here. The FCC, when it modified its rules due to the Kitoa case in 2019, the FCC took the position that they are reviewing small wires facilities as federal undertakings and major federal actions pursuant to the court decision. And that's what we've been doing. That tells you right there. Does the FCC consider small sales to be real? No, it doesn't. Legally, they have to treat them just like every other cell tower. Legally. Why is that? They lost their lawsuit. The lawsuit was vacated, uh, the order behind that lawsuit, 18-30, was vacated and remanded. Meaning they lost the definition of a small cell right there. They're being very quiet about it, <laughs> but it's true. You have to understand the whole small cell agenda was built on the foundational brick of saying there's a whole class of small wires facilities that doesn't require environmental review. And then for that definition of facility, we can add a whole bunch of benefits. Well, once the definition goes away, none of this works anymore. There's no foundation. We're one court case away from establishing all this. So I just want everybody to understand, you know, that this is a real opportunity for you, okay? When you read down this page, um, you will see that they tell you all over the place exactly what it takes in order to make a NEPA complaint. And you can make a NEPA complaint. Now, here's the problem. They went ahead and changed the rules. Hey, here's two links. One is to their website. And when you go to the website, it no longer lists a rule that we depend on. When you go to this link on the PDF, it still has the rule, okay? The rule is a very simple rule and can be applied to any, almost all these small cells, all right? And it's on this page. And if I can find it, I'll show it to you quickly. But if I know it by heart, so if I don't find it quickly, I'll tell you what it is. It is a, a rule in 1.1307 in table one. And it says, if your cell tower exceeds the federal maximum public exposure guideline, which they all do, at some distance from the tower, maybe it's 10 inches out, maybe it's two inches out, okay? If it exceeds it, that's criteria one. If the lower edge of the antenna is less than 10 meters from the ground, that's 33 feet, eight inches, and it outputs effective radiated power from all channels greater than a thousand watts, then it must go through an environmental assessment. By rule, it's nobody's judgment, it's nobody's, oh, you have to find a frog that's being hurt. You don't have to do that. You invoke the rule. The rule is in place for every cell tower that came forward from August 9th 
of 2019 all the way through May 3rd of 2021. We are doing these complaints every week. And this is what the FCC has done. The FCC doesn't want to rule on this. So the FCC will take your complaint in and they will contact the applicant and the applicant may or may not respond. But generally what happens is the tower doesn't get built because they don't want to enforce the rule because they're in the midst of changing the rule so they don't have to run into this rule anymore. But you've got a lot of towers that qualify under this rule. So I would definitely use it, okay? And it's all here on the NEPA page, okay? And it stems from this page, all about Kitoa versus the FCC. And this is worth reading as well. And it tells you all the great things the judges said in that ruling, which is the first one that started attacking the small cells. You know, unlike what Charles said early on, the FCC hasn't won many things in the last two years. They've lost most, almost all of them. So we are gaining traction every single day in, in the courts. And that's what happened on December 13th. We had a great ruling, okay? So I just wanna give you a quick tour of some of these websites so you can go back and, and visit them. Our Town, Our Choice is a very good site for that. All right, so let's go back now to uh, this one. This is actually a good. What is the opposite of wireless, right? I ask this of people. And a lot of people say, well, I think the opposite of wireless is wired, isn't it? And they go, well, think some more about wireless. What is the foundation of wireless? Well, it's really deception, right? They tell it all kinds of lies. There's deception in the setup of the guideline. There's deception in, in specific absorption rate. There's deception every step of the way. Even in these little propagation maps that bring forward, it's all deception, it's all lies. The whole thing is built on lies, okay? Well, so the opposite of wireless is actually liarless. And so that's what this is. This is liarless.com, okay? And we set this up in our fight against California. Uh, about, I guess the bad state bills in California. And we just profile what disastrous, what's disastrous about these small cells. And we pin it on this guy. This guy is Dr. Tomas Aragon. And he's a pretty special guy. He used to be the department, uh, the director of the Department of Health in San Francisco. And now he's the director of the Department of Health for the state of California. And I met with him in October, 2019. And I actually gave him evidence of child endangerment from one of these things, because we have the evidence, right? It makes these kids sick. And so kids got sick at Sacramento and in San Francisco within weeks of turning the tower on, and they had to go and spend tens of thousands of dollars to shield their house and maybe move and get these kids treated. And this is the definition of child endangerment. Well, he's a medical professional and he has a duty to report child endangerment. He hasn't reported yet. We can make him do it. And we should. And the whole point is, if he doesn't, he's not meeting the requirements of his medical license. And I don't know how you become the health director for the state of California without a medical license. He's had this information since October 2019. His whole city is very angry at him for skipping town without actually fixing the problem in San Francisco. But he did skip town. He went to California and Gavin Newsom tapped him on the shoulder and said, come work with us. Well, he's still there. We really still can make this, put this on his plate. And here's the key thing, most people don't realize, Joel Moskowitz is this great guy at the University of, of California, Berkeley, who actually collects a lot of the research and he talks to a lot of the media all about this peer reviewed research of how people get damaged by radio frequency microwave radiation, right? So you would think, okay, great. So what's the connection here? <laughs> Moskowitz uh, is the boss of Aragon. Aragon is an assistant professor there. They know each other personally. So the very evidence that Moskowitz gave the appellant in San Francisco is what was put on his desk in October of 2019. So there's no way. It's all in the record. He can't walk away from it, right? So the bottom line is he's pregnant with this and he needs to do something. And now that we've had that great ruling on August 13th, there's no way. There's no way he can actually still stay silent. This is the kinds of things, the kinds of leverage that you create by telling the truth, putting things in the record, and making these people responsible for taking actions on what is put in the record. The whole thing here is look at your opportunity when you speak in city council meetings as not complaining and whining about how unfair it is and how you feel bad about it and how you're worried about things, anything that's emotional. 
take that opportunity to put evidence into the public record. And when you do, that's when you start getting leverage over people because you don't have to actually say you're gonna get an attorney. You don't actually have to spend the money on that. You don't actually even wanna ever inform anybody you're getting an attorney because the minute you do, your local officials will no longer talk to you. But what your city attorney does pay attention to is the kinds of evidence that you put in the record in order to then potentially be used in the future. That means any attorney can walk up and access what's in the public record and can use it for their own purposes. Here's the beauty of what happened on August 13th. We had some pretty great people working on that case. W. Scott McCullough was the lead attorney, Daphne Tackover, and Scott worked hand in hand. And we had Edward B. Myers over on Environmental Health Trust. These are top notch people. What did they do for us? They put over 11,000 pages of evidence into the FCC's record, all about the damages from radio frequency microwave radiation. <gasps> oh my God, thank you. We get to use that just by linking to it. You get to put that into your own city's public record by copying and pasting some links off of my website and putting it into your public comment. Ta-da! Huge amounts of evidence in the public record why the small sales cannot continue on. This helps you, see? The more evidence you can stack in your favor against your city, the more you will win. It is not about complaining. It is all about the evidence, all right? So I'm gonna show you one other page here, then maybe we'll, we'll break and do, do the questions. I'm gonna to go to uh, this one, unsafeatnnyg.com. Unsafeatnnyg.com is a little takeoff on this book. Some of the older people know this book. This is Unsafe at Any Speed. This was published in 1965 by one Ralph Nader. It basically threw the, the core of air under the bus and said it was a terribly unsafe car. Well, it was a little unfair to Corvair, but what did it lead to? It led to the National Highway Traffic and Safety Act, which led to mandatory seat belts and airbags and speed limits that actually saved a ton of lives. How many lives? Let's take a look. We used to kill 100,000 people a year on the roads way back, you know, it kept kept going down and going down and going down to now we're only killing about 30,000 a year. Well, it's still bad that we're killing 30,000 people a year, but it's a lot better than killing 100,000 people a year by putting in decent regulation. So that's the whole point here. This whole industry needs the unsafe at any G book to basically say we need seatbelts, airbags, and, uh, and speed limits for the wireless industry. And once we get them in place, We'll still have wireless, but we'll do it in a way that is not so damaging, all right? The reason I'm coming here is to show you that idea, but also to show you this page that we used to defeat a tower in Petaluma, right here. It was a terrible, terrible tower. Look at this amount of power. 16 antennas, 2.4 million watts of ERP right in the middle of downtown on these four antennas, and there are houses on all sides of it. They came forward in August of 2019, and it wasn't until January 2021 that we got on to walk away. And how did we do it? This page will show you the evidence we put into the public record. And every time I put an email in, I give it to everybody, the city attorney, to all the council members, all the planning commissioners, all the historic committee members, nobody's left off. And I say right up front, this nice little paragraph, and this is what you need on every one of your emails right here. This is a trick. Use this one. Copy paste this. Hey, City Clerk Rose, will you please add this email letter to the public record for a particular file? Will you please print it, put it in the paper file? When it goes forward, we have to make sure it's there. We'll be following up to make sure you're managing the public record right. That's your job, City Clerk. And so we did this. And we have in that file four and a half inches of evidence that dwarfs the size of the application. We won, Verizon walked away. They realized we had the evidence stacked against them. That's how you win. That's exactly it right there. One other announcement I'm gonna make is that we know there's a lot of information. This is the new site we're putting up. This is called the truth about wireless bit by bit. It's called bite size gigabytes and uh, gigabits. And what are we doing? We're gonna do a video podcast. It's gonna go out twice a week. 
And it's brought to you by some people who are already in our movement who know a lot about this. And so we're going to go ahead and uh, put these out as video and audio podcasts. You can get them in your podcast catcher. And we have a whole series of things that we hope to do. Okay, so uh, what we, we go is we'll go into the media side and uh, your hosts are over here. And they are Jenny and Courtney and Heidi. And these are moms who are smart and they're defending their communities and their families. And they're going to share with you what they've been learning. And what do we have is in the video podcast, they have these recurring things. And these recurring things will be short programs. Number one, we're going to do two, three minute how-tos, okay? Really helpful how-tos. What's the best way to wire my house? Quick how-to, that's great. What's the best way to manage my phone? Quick how-to. What's the best way to do testimony at my local city? A quick how-to. So the whole idea is to get this good information out to you simply and easily. And you can always, you know, email us if you have any other questions and, and want some extra help. And then we're going to have these things called layman's corners. Okay. And what that is, is just, you know, what do you say to somebody who knows nothing about this issue? How do you get through to them? And so we go through a series of those. And then there's symptoms and snake oil. All right. Well, that's about, hey, this is an economic opportunity out here, right? A lot of people think, oh, you have to protect yourself from radio frequency microwave radiation. I will sell this product. I will make certain claims to tell you it will help you. Look, there's a lot of stuff out there that doesn't do anything, but they keep selling it to you. So you should at least know what is good and what is not good, what works, what doesn't work. Okay. Uh, mini bites. We have a woman uh, fighting a cell tower, uh, Courtney, in Pittsfield, and her kid is 13, does 30 to 60 second public surface video announcements. We're going to feature those. Okay. We'll have stuff about electromagnetic sensitivity. And then we'll sit down with Judge Heidi and talk about telecom law because Heidi's done a good job and she's mastered a lot of this. So the whole point is it's going to be a fun thing. People really enjoy it. Uh, it's going to be uh, on YouTube and Odyssey and BitChute. And it's also going to be on in your podcast catchers. So that's coming down the pike. And we're just in the in the planning stages of this. It'll probably launch on November 1. Okay. So in addition to that, uh, there's a lot of good information just at Wire America. And that's got a little blog and search tab. So you can always search for there. And there's ways to stay in touch with people. And so it's an easy way to get more information and uh, answer any questions that people have. Part, uh, most of my questions are related to, uh, I'm in Colorado, and we have one of those ALEC laws. And so uh, some of the antidotes that you were talking about, I'm wondering if they apply in Colorado or if they just apply in the states that don't have. Um, no, no, they apply in Colorado. What I'm saying to you is that this is up to you to uh, work your way through that law. And you have to you look at it from the eye of an opportunist and a, and a lawyer to figure out where the wedge is. And I'm telling you, usually it's in public safety. And so what you do is you look for the word term public safety, and you'll find that most of them have some kind of little out for public safety. And so as such, then you drive a wedge through that. And you basically say, let's define public safety for our town. What does it mean? Let's do it. And so guess what? These qualify as threatening public safety. So now you have an out to say no to these towers. So does the Mozilla ruling uh, about uh, uh, telecommunications, does that also apply in Colorado then with the ALEC law? Yes, of course. Now, look, ALEC does, first of all, ALEC writes these laws, but they never become laws until they're actually voted in by your elected representatives. So they this have model is, this, legislation. This, is, this has been voted in. No, I get it. I understand. So, so look, the point is that Every single one is slightly different just because there was whatever negotiation process went on in your state legislature. And so certain things get in there and other things get taken out. And, you know, who knows exactly how does Colorado's compare to Arizona's unless you sat down and read it and did the comparison. This is a lot of work, but you can do it. I, but my I point have... is that a lot of people go, oh, it's so complicated. I'll never get to it. And they don't make the progress they could. And what you want to do is absolutely dissect that state law and see okay. what you have that you could possibly work with. It, it does allow towers and antennas in any zone. Yes. And it does, um, and it does uh, reduce the amount that can be charged uh, for the use of the right of way. And it, uh, so it does do a lot of stuff, but uh, part of what, uh, I mean, I, I worked on trying to repeal that uh, 1193 and, um, we decided not to, partly because we thought we might be more prone to getting more industry bills, especially as 
California was getting a lot of those. Um, we had input from some of the telecom lawyers uh, that you know as well that we would, you know, that it wasn't it wasn't worth our while to try to repeal that Alec law. Let me comment on that, if I may. Yes. Okay. This is your life and your neighborhood. At the end of the day, these are your decisions to make. And so it is nice to receive advice from anyone else, but you will be facing the consequences of your efforts or lack of efforts. And that's all there is. So you will find that everybody has an opinion and everybody will give you an assessment, and every, but no one can accurately predict the future, not a single one. So you sit down and go, oh, I was convinced to sit on the bench on this one. I was convinced not to repeal something. And you have to sit there and go, well, based on what? Nobody can project what's really gonna happen. Nobody can project that you will be hit with more bills or not bills. And so that is just a false reason for not repealing. At the end of the day, should you repeal your state bill? Yes, as soon as humanly possible. It is one of the most unconstitutional worst bills I've ever seen in my life. That's why we fought like tooth and nail never to have it passed in California. And we took every avenue there was. If they had passed that bill, we were coming right in with a lawsuit. Okay, so the point is we take this very seriously here because we know that if these things come in front of our houses, we'll have to move. And I don't want to do that. That is just a terrible thing to force somebody to do. So what I'm saying to you is that think about this. You're in a foxhole and you have a whole bunch of weapons sitting around you. And so the question is, you know, a lot of people debate back and forth, which weapon should I fire and when, and should I do it this way or that way? Or some smart person thinks we should hold back on this one. And I say, screw all that. Fire all of the weapons. When? Now. You never know which one's going to work. We never knew we had this whole bullshit addressing thing and how they're coming into the rights of way and actually trying to get ownership of stuff that they don't even own the land on. And this is the stuff that's going on behind the scenes and we're uncovering it right now. Well, my God, this is great. This will work in Colorado. This will upend your whole state bill. <laughs> you have a land use and planning act in addition to this telecom act guess what those two laws are no longer consistent because you have well-established planning principles that have been in place for over 100 years look lots of these bills are not well written so they don't anticipate everything how many of these bills anticipate that they have to actually adhere to the americans with disabilities act none of them how many do have to adhere to the americans with disabilities act all of them <laughs> So this is what I'm trying to say, is these bills are crap, really. And you get to blow them apart. You win with strength in numbers, okay? So even though you might have a tight team of five or six people that are willing to do the reading and do the work and do most of the speaking, how you win is you get the 200 people behind you, okay? And they're either in the room going, oh, 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 yeah, we support them. Yeah, go, go, go. And they all tell you, don't clap, don't do that. Ignore them. You have First Amendment rights. You can show your support anytime you want. This is a little harder to do in Zoom. And what I would suggest that you do right now is that you upend all these Zoom meetings. You force them to go back into in-person meetings because you will only get your advantage when you're in in-person meetings. This is a completely a political thing. And this is completely about getting enough people to show up in a like mind in one place. This is what I'm trying to say. We, the people, are a lot more powerful than these people trying to make these decisions shove them down our throat. We just have to have enough people stand together. Great. Thanks again for today. Yeah.